Hey watercolor wizards, Hajra here. Today I'll be doing an ink and wash piece inspired by the characters from the 1986 film Labyrinth. Thanks for parking your brushes here and let the epic painting adventures begin. Free Skillshare video links, art blogs, Q&As, sketches, deconstructed paintings, video notes, and art gifts are all at a single convenient tier for patrons on Patreon. One of the projects I started working on for Inktober last year was a Kai Nielsen master study morphed into the ballroom scene from the 1986 movie Labyrinth. I only managed to do the pencil sketch last year, and then even this year, I only got to the inking part during Inktober, which I filmed and it sat around until now. So I'm using 9 inch by 12 inch Arches hot press watercolor paper and a Zig Writer marker to ink my sketch. Because this was a larger project than I usually paint for my weekly YouTube video, this video is a few days late because it took me more time to paint for, edit, and voice over this video. I'm going to use my trick of dipping a brush into the marker ink for super fine lines, and that's something you'll see me do often in my ink pieces and videos. Inking with a teeny brush is essential to painting faces this small. The facial features here are smaller than my pinky now. Here's Kai Nielsen's illustration, which he did for the popular fairy tale The Twelve Dancing Princesses for the Brothers Grimm. His original illustration was an ink and wash piece, and I'll be retaining that with thin ink outlines and watercolor washes for the color. Nielsen was one of the artists inspired by Edmond Duloc, and both men created some of the most memorable fairy tale and storybook illustrations during the Golden Age. Nielsen was very fond of sylph-like, simply drawn figures, high key glazes of color, and a pattern sense that merged Art Nouveau with Art Deco. This is actually one of my favorite illustrations by Kai Nielsen, with its areas of dainty pointillism and delicate patterns on textiles, like the florals on the princess's gown. As is typical of Nielsen, the male and female figures are both slender as reeds, waif-like with cultish limbs. So I could easily have done another master study, totally faithful to Nielsen's original piece, but as I've mentioned in other posts, sometimes it's more fun to play paper dolls with an old illustration and dress the figures differently and change other elements for a hybrid piece that's part original, part master study. For more ideas about master studies variations, see my separate post for that on Patreon. I have several more master studies planned for next year, but after I'm done with those, I'll be shifting away from half master studies and half original videos on my channel to mostly originals, because I've done so many master studies over the past few years and I want to reserve more of my limited handwork time for original paintings in the near future. I'll still discuss art history, style, and techniques, and old artwork in my videos, but I'll do it as relevant to my original paintings. And of course, on Patreon, I often post deconstructed painting posts of old master's pieces or exhibits I see on display at the Fine Art Museums in San Francisco. So I definitely ended up with a hybrid original piece this time around because every time I looked at Nielsen's illustration, the ballroom scene from Labyrinth with Sarah and Jareth the Goblin King sprang to my mind. I was born in the 80s, so I have very fond memories of the movie Labyrinth starring Jennifer Connelly and David Bowie, and it remains one of the most creatively original fantasy adventure films ever made. So when I sat down to sketch my study, it turned into a drawing of Sarah and Jareth instead, with the maze and the castle behind them. The poses of the figures are the same as the Nielsen illustration, but I've altered just about everything else. The faces, the hair, the costumes, the background to make this look more like Sarah and Jareth. For my colors later, I'll be using the movie's ballroom scene costumes as my influence. Definitely a lot of violets and dark blues. You can also see there are some contrasting warm oranges in the movie still to their right and in the background. It's good color and temperature contrast to retain the darkest, coolest colors for the main characters. In one of the movie posters for the film, we can see the same near complementary color scheme of violet and some blue violet along with orange. The labyrinth and characters behind Sarah are mostly warm, sandy, rusty orange in contrast to her cool dark violets that continue to the bottom border of the image. This poster keeps a good likeness of Bowie, but the painting of Sarah looks nothing like the actress Jennifer Connelly, so not such a good job of painting her face. I'm going to try to get a better likeness of Jennifer in my painting, even though it'll be tough since the face in my piece is so tiny. It's still a well-designed poster with a great high fantasy Art Nouveau vibe. I especially like how the piece transitions from warm at top to cool at the bottom and uses a white castle silhouette as a framing device to separate Sarah from the complicated huddle of characters all around her. The exact colors I ended up using were from Sennelier, their pan watercolors, and these were dioxazine violet, ultramarine blue, Payne's gray, orange, and a few dashes of vermilion as an accent color. The sky was a simple dioxazine violet dropped in wet and wet, and I never was happy with it. 
Sometimes wet and wet skies turn out just fabulously awesome, and other times they can just be blah. So I might go back and change the sky at some point in time, but other than adding some more violet to it later, I didn't do much else to it for now. I used some leftover Sennelier orange, dulled a bit with a dioxazine violet for the labyrinth base. This is an opaque orange pigment to begin with, so it lifted a bit later when I came to layer over it. I tried to use a light touch to help some with that, but to avoid that lifting problem, use staining colors that are transparent or semi-transparent. The dioxazine violet is both a staining and a granulating color, so wherever the violet was used in this painting, it pretty much stayed put like I was using ink. For the second layer, I mixed a more purple heavy orange mix and added some shadows to all that labyrinth area. And it's going to look fine now, but later as the characters are put in with cooler blues and violets, it'll seem too warm to me, so I'm going to cool it down further later. The background is far away and not the focal point, so it's totally alright just leaving it more simple. I did follow my own advice and do the background first this time, but I was super excited to finally move on to the figures. One of the reasons a lot of my pieces are white on white is because I find backgrounds boring and so I just skip them. I know, I shouldn't be so childish, but I often omit them for that reason. And I'm glad to push myself to do them more, like I did with this piece. I just have to remind myself that it doesn't have to be a full, super involved background. It can be simple or stylized, and that'll make it something I can deal with. And I do love the stark, really pretty, crisp, botanical journal feel of having no background at all to a lot of my pieces. So it's not like I'm going to give that up, but it would be nice to also have some pieces with backgrounds like this one. I did the skin tones with diluted orange mixed with a bit of purple for the shadows. I was thinking of not having any red in this piece, including for the lips or the flushed skin areas, but I caved in and added just a bit of red mixed into the violet for the lips and cheeks. The faces are super tiny, so this is wet on dry, unlike the wet on wet sky. I referred to my screenshot from the film to make the woman look like Jennifer Connelly. Again, the two faces and heads were totally unlike what Nielsen has in his fairy tale illustration, so it was really helpful that I had a profile shot from the movie to help my drawing. When doing a face this small, you have to distill and reduce to just the hallmarks of the desired face. For the King Jareth character, I wasn't as concerned as making him totally faithful to how Bowie looked. I was fine making him look more generic and younger and more dashing, so he looks near in age to Jennifer, unlike in the movie. So with Jennifer, I know she has thick 80s eyebrows and a particular nose and nostril profile and a high forehead, and painting in those things was enough to capture her likeness. I also tried to follow her eye socket shape and lip and chin shape, but the eyebrows and nose shape and forehead size were the hallmark features in this small profile angle. I also added some low lights to Jarrett's blonde hair because it looked too sunny and bright and it was the only place yellow was used in this painting. And I wanted it to fit in more with the rest of the piece so I streaked some blue shadow glazes into his hair as well. When I moved on to the clothes, starting with the cape, I understood that the fabrics would be the focal point of this painting since the faces were so very small and there was so much more fabric all around when we see the whole piece zoomed out. So I tried to make the fabrics not boring. I tried to make the clothes as interesting as their own characters. 
This resulted in making this more like a fashion illustration in some ways, since the clothes had the spotlight. I used ultramarine blue, dioxazine violet, and Payne's gray in turns for the cape to give it temperature, value, and hue variation. It would have been fine to do it all in a single blue, but definitely less interesting. So because I was striving for more visual interest, I used all three colors. It was fun to balance colors as I changed between them, and I think it made his cape much more magical in feel as a result. I painted the cape wet on wet in some areas and wet on dry in others with softened blended edges. For a billowing cape, I need to make sure there are highlights to convey the peak of the rippling folds. I did his tunic and leggings with the same principles in mind, of leaving white paper highlight areas and changing between blue, violet, and gray. Nielsen's original had a monotone black costume with no highlights or shadows and no other colors, so it was more work to do my version of a costume, especially because I'd added a cape on too. But I added all that complexity along with the big cape since I wanted to draw Jareth. Whenever I do something like this, it feels like going to a Halloween costume party. I can dress up someone as another character, except for I can do it right at my desk, so it's just so fun and magical feeling. I didn't have any full body photo references for Sarah's dress or for Jarrett's costume because I just couldn't find any full figure shots that worked from the movie, and I even looked at people who were cosplaying these characters and I just didn't like anything. So the fabrics were painted intuitively, with the highest part of the fold just being the highlight and the two receding sides of the fold darkening into a shadow color. If you watched my live stream from last year where I painted those fun rainbow hot air balloons, I used the exact same simple shadow and highlight shading that I used for the balloons, but I just curved it a bit to follow the contours of his cape or tunic or leggings or her dress. So you can use general shading rules like the one I used for the hot air balloons to render a costume like this when you don't have a photo reference to help. And so your memory and imagination and your learned painting tools can help replace a photo reference for such pieces. Once I got to the character of Sarah, I had a bit of a dilemma. She has a mostly white dress in the movie, though it has shimmery fabric and sparkly embellishments. The color of the shadows in the dress are actually more greenish in the movie, but in my version I used violet and red violet shadows because I like the violet better as a fantasy and romantic color, and also because there's no other green I'm using in this painting and I wanted to keep to a limited color scheme. I darkened up the violet in the sky a bit more in a second pass of wet and wet color. And I also realized at this point that the labyrinth background looked warmer than I wanted, 
So I added wet and wet violet as a bleeding glaze over the castle and maze background in various areas to cool it down and push it further back in the distance. And blurring out the labyrinth more also helped make the background look more mysterious. And because the orange I used was opaque, it did lift and scoot around a bit under the water in glazing. Again, to minimize lifting, use staining colors that are transparent or semi-transparent. So when I come back to the dress, the first thing I decided was to add more texture and color to the gown to make it more complex and to imply shimmery gossamer layers. To start that process off, I dropped in some red violets for warmer areas and pure violet color for cooler areas wet and wet into the bulk of the dress and then placed plastic saran wrap all over it since it gives a texture of bunched up shapes if you put it down over wet paint. You have to make sure there's enough wet pigment to cluster under the wrap and then you have to leave it there to dry before removing it. And I thought the saran wrap would be a good starting point for the implication of lots of crinkly, layered, and sheer fabric. But if I stopped there, it would have been like I had stamped draft texture all over her, so I'm going to do more to this once it's dry. I ended up doing the three floating crystal balls off screen because I totally forgot all about them while I was painting other things, but they'll also be a red violet and not a violet or blue. I returned to her lips and her cheek and forehead to add that red violet mix from the dress to her face. It'll make the color on her face more vibrant, and it also suits the piece now that there was more red violet all throughout the dress area. All the little red violet touches will stand out more as warmer spots next to all the larger regions of cooler blues and violets in Jarrett's costume. I also shifted Jarrett's brooches and rose away from violet to a red violet along with Sarah's rings all for the same reason. The plastic wrap is clear so I could see that underneath the paint was not settling at all like I wanted in the bodice and the upper dress area. So I pulled off the plastic wrap in that area and yep, there was a smeary mess underneath. And it was clear that I had to go back and clean up and lift texture that didn't look pretty or had smeared. So first I tried my best to lift and lighten the paint that had smeared and gone over the lines or into areas where it didn't look pretty. This is important to do before I bring out the big guns with the white gouache because if you leave paint there that can be lifted, then it will muddy the white paint coming over the top later. So get as much paint off there first. And then I use white gel pen, which is basically just white gouache and a stick for the smaller areas. And then I use some white gouache paint from a pan with a paintbrush later in larger areas I wanted to cover. Sometimes if the area to fix and cover up is small and I'm too lazy to pull out more paint, I just use the white pen. And I use the pen in her hair pieces and as highlights on all the jewelry and rings first. And then I address the mess on the dress. I went over certain areas for highlights in the fabric to imply it was a lighter dress and that can be done just by applying the white via the pen or from a pan paint and then smoothing and blending it out as needed with another damp clean brush. So this could be a really scary result to deal with where it might seem like all is lost once you get staining smears like this on a watercolor painting, but unless you have some sort of transparent watercolor contest prohibition against using some white paint, you can just pull out some white gouache to cover it up and make it all okay. And then I pulled off the rest of the plastic wrap and continued to cover smears and mold specific dress areas to have lighter and highlight areas. I also added shimmery reflective highlight illusions by stippling in little dots with the white gel pen. I did this for Sarah's gown but also for Jarrett's shoulder area because he also had shiny rhinestones there in the movie. For both characters, I try to keep the dots in the darkest paint areas of the selected regions for better contrast and visibility of those little dots. So then I just had to repeat the white highlights in larger areas of the dress and the little white dot stippling in various areas until I had a color balance that made me happy. I left the rest of the piece in transparent watercolor and just used the white gouache as a patch up tool for this dress and it didn't ruin anything or look weird. Even though I have highlights in Jarrett's costume that are just the white of the paper, and in Sarah's costume, I'm going to have white highlights that are going to be white paint. They still didn't look jarring next to each other. I said this before in another video. Comedian Chris Rock mentioned Robitussin cough syrup as, as a snake oil cure-all for any ailment, according to one of his uncles. And I feel like white gouache is my Robitussin cough syrup. It will save a watercolor piece, a gouache piece, an ink piece. So it's sort of a miracle cure-all for a messed up painting if you know how to work it. Now, if you're using acrylic or oil, which are waterproof when they're dry, then you don't want to use white gouache. 
you're just going to use white acrylic or white oil paint. And around this point, I had been at this piece for many hours, which you can probably tell just from how long this video is, despite being sped up seven times. And the sunlight from my window was now creeping onto the desk to create a square of glare. So I stopped filming after a while. And I was planning on waiting till the glare went away in an hour to finish up and film the rest of the piece but there's only the stippling left on the tress along with the crystal balls, which I forgot all about until later. So I ended up just doing those last finishes off screen since there was so little left to do and I was so impatient to just get it done. I just wanted it to be a lighter dress overall, so I added white highlights down all the fabric segments. Remember, it's the same way I painted those hot air balloons, long vertical highlight down the center, and darker shadow folds of the fabric on the sides. And then, thank god, I was finally done with this painting, which at 9 by 12 may not be much for other artists, but it's a lot of work for me due to my hypermobility issues. I usually do smaller pieces nowadays for this reason, but every now and again there is a painting that just can't be as small. Well, wizards, hope you enjoyed what I shared of the process for my labyrinth piece. Again, this is one of my favorite movies since I was born in the 80s, and I really wanted to capture the nostalgia, fantasy, and magic I feel when I think of these characters. I was really happy with the Sarah character looking like Jennifer Connelly, despite the teeny face I had to work on, and also how both the costumes were interesting enough to hold attention as focal points because people did comment on how much they liked the costumes on Instagram. And I was agreeing with someone who commented about wanting this dress. Too bad a ball gown like this would cost a fortune in real life, but at least I can paint one. Please like, comment, subscribe, and check out my website links, Skillshare, and Patreon page to support my art and art channel below. Thanks for parking your brushes here and wishing you all fantastical art adventures.